I'm talking today about breast interventions. So here we go. And welcome to the new year, everyone. Congrats. We all made it. Now I'm sitting working. Okay, so before we talk about interventions, I wanted to talk about things we don't intervene on. Um, so oil cysts, fat necrosis, um, those are things that happen after you have trauma to the breast, whether it's a car accident or surgery, um, sometimes just bruising from random things, big dog jumping on people is one that we see often. Um, involuting fibroadenomas, they're going to calcify. Uh, sometimes we will see people referred, even outside people who read a CT and see big calcified lesions, they'll get referred for a biopsy. We don't need to biopsy those. Um, hemartomas, breast within a breast, fibroadenolipoma, they're also called. We don't need to biopsy those. Those are benign lesions. Can be diagnosed mammographically even because of their characteristic appearance. And sebaceous cysts or epidermal inclusion cysts, we don't need to biopsy those. Those are skin lesions. Um, if anything, they should be surgically excised if they're bothering the patient. So examples of those things we don't need to mess with. Um, a bad, you don't really want to, you don't really want to diagnose this by ultrasound. It can be confusing. But if you see this on a CT, uh, that's benign. These big chunky calcifications in the rim of this, that's, that's a benign lesion. We don't want to mess with that. The mammogram, this is also chunky calcifications. Look like, looks like that stuck on a mammogram. It's hard to tell with an ultrasound, but if you did see this on ultrasound and you don't have a mammogram on this patient, you're going to say, I'm not sure about that. That's suspicious. Let's get a mammogram. Um, but usually we start with mammogram unless it's a young patient. So um, either way, you're going to have a mammogram on this, and you'll say, that's an oil cyst. We don't need to do anything with that. Okay. Um, uh, involuting fibroadenoma benign, we don't need to biopsy that. Those big, chunky, dystrophic calcifications, that doesn't need any intervention. We just let that go. Um, breast within a breast, hemartoma, fibroadenolipoma, um, don't need to mess with that. And that's on the wrong slide. That's actually a, a mole. Um, this is a radiopaque skin lesion marker that the tech puts on the patient before they do a mammogram. So we'll know that's not in the breast, that's on the skin. So that's put on by the technologist before they get the mammogram. And that's a little BB marking the nipple for us. But this is one of those don't touch lesions, big hemartoma. That's a mammographic diagnosis, doesn't need a biopsy. And here's some sebaceous cysts, don't need to do anything with those. This is a, this triangle marker is what we use here to say that this is a palpable abnormality. So this is also something put on by the technologist telling us not a skin lesion, but something that the patient feels. So we can go ultrasound it because it's palpable, but what we're going to see is that it's in the skin. So it connects with the skin. It's not in the breast parenchyma. We don't need to mess with that. Um, so these markers that I just talked about, they, are, um, they vary by institution. So like this, is another institution and they use those BB markers to say something's palpable. So just because we use these radiopaque markers here to say it's palpable doesn't mean that's across the board. If you go somewhere else when you get done here, they might use this little BB to say it's palpable where we use the triangle here. You just need to ask when you get there, you know, what means what. So um, in any case, none of these things do we need to do any intervention on. But this is just a list of the things we do do in breast ductograms, um, ductography it's also called, ultrasound guided core biopsy, stereotactic guided core biopsy, cyst aspiration, um, kind of the same thing as seroma and abscess drainage, preoperative wire localization which can be done using mammographic or sonographic guidance, um, kind of things we don't do as often or don't have here yet cryoablation, MR biopsy, and tomosynthesis guided biopsy. Okay, so ductograms. They're not performed as frequently um, because of the increasing availability of MRI. Um, so we use ductogram to evaluate bloody or clear nipple discharge. So we do a ductogram when there's 
discharge that's bloody or clear from a single duct in on one side okay um, usually bloody nipple discharge is caused by a, an introductal papilloma um, but you do worry about breast cancer okay so you can do the ductogram and it'll it'll when we put contrast in it shows the ducts and sometimes you can see a little um, a little clear space within the ducts that can indicate a little cancer or a papilloma, something that's a blockage, okay? But oftentimes we're asked to do ductograms for any number of reasons that aren't necessarily indicated. Um, so a ductogram is not indicated if, if um, the discharge is bilateral, if, it's, if they're squeezing and, it, and the discharge is coming out, okay, it, it needs to be um, non-spontaneous, so it happens just um, any time. Okay, so if they're squeezing their breast, the discharge is coming out. If it's coming out of multiple ducts from both nipples, if it's coming out of the areola, so not the nipple, but from the area around the nipple, if it's green, if it's greenish, if it's brown, if it's brownish, if it's greenish yellow, if it's milky, if it's anything other than clear or bloody, okay? Because those things are usually either due to cysts or ductectasia or hormonal imbalances, um, thyroid issues, um, other hormone things, okay? Um, and one of the reasons, um, besides the fact that usually if it's a papilloma or some cancer, it only affects one duct, we need it to be from one duct to let us know where to put our little catheter, okay? Um, it also needs to be happening the morning of the ductogram so we can tell to what, where to put our little catheter. So this is an example of bloody nipple discharge from a single duct the morning of the exam. So that's a good candidate for a ductogram, okay? So here's the radiologist, the little tiny catheter, putting it into a single duct, tiny, tiny little catheter. We inject about uh, up to one cc of contrast material. If the patient feels pain, stop. If it starts to come out of the, if you get backwash from the duct, stop. Um, but then you hold the catheter up to the nipple where you injected the contrast and you, we take two views of the breast to see if there are any blockages in the duct, okay? And that can be needle loped for the surgeon to take that out. Um, so um, we really need it to be from just a single duct so we can tell where to put our little catheter. If there's multiple ducts, we don't know what to evaluate. Um, okay, this is, kinda, this is not done nearly as much as it was done in the past um, because a lot of times we can tell our ultrasound is so good now that we can evaluate ducts really well, subareolar ducts and the ducts adjacent to the nipple. We can see introductal masses now really well. Um, and an adjunct to that MRI is really good at seeing, you know, enhancing masses within the ducts um, and in the area adjacent. So a lot of times we use that um, instead of this. So, and because sometimes they're having the bloody nipple discharge, you schedule the exam and they're not having it that day. So um, it's kind of difficult to make that happen. Okay, ultrasound guided core biopsy. So masses visible on ultrasound obviously are amenable to this. Um, it's preferred to stereotactic core biopsy for masses that are visible on ultrasound. It's faster usually, it's more comfortable for the patient because they're not having to lay prone like they have to in stereo biopsy. Um, less work for the tech and it's less expensive. So we do use a sterile field put a sterile probe cover over the ultrasound probe. Uh, we inject lidocaine sub-Q, not lido with epi, just regular lidocaine. Inject it um, before the anterior to the mass, into the mass, and uh, through the mass. Um, usually, we use a, a 14 gauge bard and take about five samples. If we're not sure we're getting good samples, we'll take a few more than that. Um, and it's important, unlike other biopsies like an IR where you're sampling the liver or whatever that we take our samples horizontally rather than parallel um, because 
underneath the breast is the lung. And I have seen the, um, a patient get a pneumo before when you go through the breast and directly into the lung. So um, that's why we're using <coughs> the sound, you know, to give us the benefit of seeing exactly where we're going, make sure we're going through the mass and not, you know, down into what's beyond. So, um, you know, ultrasound gives us the benefit to know that the correct area is being sampled because you're using image guidance. Um, you know, they do still do FNAs over in Surge Onc Clinic. Um, well, they do, they'll do, they'll do cores if it's palpable, if it's big enough and they can feel it, they'll just core it there. Um, but, you know, with the use of ultrasound, obviously we can see exactly where we're going. Um, and as opposed to FNA, our samples are bigger, so it allows them to get receptors. So if it's positive, they can go ahead and test the ER and PR so they know if the tumor is responsive. Um, so that is kind of a benefit as opposed to them doing it over there in clinic. And also we can put a tissue marker in um, while we're doing our core versus an FNA where you can't put a tissue marker in. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so like I said, a tissue marker is placed, which is really important if they're gonna get neoadjuvant chemo. Um, Again, I use lidocaine for local. Um, the needle is larger than an FNA needle, and I do have to make a small incision versus an FNA where there's no incision. But the, I mean, it's tiny, tiny incision, just big enough to get the 14 gauge needle through there. Okay, so this this is the 14 gauge bard. It's just you know you cock those two buttons back and. Um, then I count to three, press that green button, and it takes a sample. Um, so the well comes out 19, uh, 1.9 centimeters, takes a sample, and then pulls it back, and then you put it in the specimen cup, formalin. The important thing is to get the sample in formalin, the sample into formalin immediately, and then you can get it to path whenever. It's just important to get it in formalin. Um, and then this is our tissue marker that we use. So this is a little safety. <clears throat> you slide that button over, then when you get it into position, push that blue button down and it puts that little titanium marker. It looks like a little breast cancer ribbon on the mammogram. Okay, so here's just some pictures of doing the, so there's the ultrasound probe, numb up with lidocaine, make a little incision, and that's actually an old, old school um, one that you had to sterilize after every procedure. So here's the needle, perfect technique going horizontally through the mass. In order to do that, so your incisions up here, you have to kind of go vertically and then level out and get horizontal through the mass. And this kind of shows you, you know, how you would do that you know, vertically and then horizontally through the lesion. And here's a you know, the difference in going this way and then horizontally through the lesion. And so ribs here, you know, you want to make sure you don't go this way. So it's harder than it seems to get horizontal. When they're really deep, breasts are really small, it's, um, it can be really difficult. And here's what the sample looks like in the bottom of the little formalin cup. Okay, we'll see if this plays. So I was talking to Tom, he was on the rotation last time. So if you've been on the rotation, one of the hardest parts is getting the needle back into position to get your sample again. Because the breast tissue moves unlike the liver and thyroid and other things. So it can be hard to get your needle back at the mass. So there are vacuum assisted devices like we use in stereo that you can use doing ultrasound biopsies. The gauge is bigger, um, like 11, 11 gauge, they have 9 gauges and um, I think 11 most of them are. But so you, you put that in there, you can also use a coaxial and put the um, biopsy needle in there and just do one one sample and so it samples the whole thing and that way you don't have to keep taking it out and putting it back into the 
mass. So that way you don't have to reposition so much. So this kind of shows, if I can get it to, Stacy, you might have to help. It might not work. Hmm? Enable content. Oh. Thanks, Coulter. This is a case on Netgram, and it seems to be seen on ultrasound, so I'm going to Is that going to mess it up? So when we do an ultrasound guided biopsy of this nodule. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to prep it with, with uh, color prep, which is an antiseptic. So I'm going to start with one that's in the central region and kind of work out. And then I'm going to put my sturdy drape over, keep things sterile. I can just put this in the area we go into. And I just like to lay some still towels in the area so I can put my transducer down. And I use some still gel. And then I'm going to look for the marker. So I see here, I'm going to center it. And I use 10% lidocaine, and when I, I usually now let's look at the course of the uh, transducer here, and I go kind of in the parallel part with the transducer or, or approach. So I'm just going to numb up a little superficially there, and now I'm going to numb up deeper. So you can see on this needle coming into the nozzle there already, but I'm going to apply some numbing. Let it work for a little bit. Now I'll make a little small incision with the blade. My entry point. And I usually like to bring the, the blade in as far as it will go just to form a nice track in there for, to make it easier for my needle to traverse. Now what I'm going to use is a vacuum assisted device. It's a 10 gauge uh, needle. I already loaded it, it was easy to load, just uh, bring the uh, cartridge inside and then she sets it up for me and it's ready, the green light's ready to go. So I'm going to introduce the needle and uh, bring it into the nozzle. I see the needle here. So this one seems to be a little hard, so there is a firing mechanism that you can use this needle in that you close the light the nozzle here and it's a two centimeter throw. Um, but I'm not going to fire it. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually put the, uh, I know where my direction I need to go. Okay, so now I can actually uh, point the, the opening of the aperture towards the nozzle there, because I'm at the edge of it, and I'm going to get a sample here. So now what's going to happen is that it's going to uncover. Suctions the tissue in, and then it cuts it, and then it covers back up, and I got my sample. So I'm going to uncover, and I have my sample here, and I'll just go and grab it. Again, it's a very nice sample. So I'm just going to press this button and have it reset. And go and get one sample. I usually get two samples of this. Now, the needle also comes with a coaxial device, which can be used as well. So basically, I would be putting the coaxial device right through the nozzle. And we've been working this. So, it's not like that position there. I think what I need to do is to remove the inner side of that. Yeah, I like 
about that, so I think we'll back it up just a little bit. So we'll get our core there. Okay, so you get the idea. So instead of me, how I do with the bard, you know, taking several, I mean, I go five biopsies, basically that's a nine gauge, you know, so it's a much bigger sample. And yeah, it is. That's the problem, you know, if you're smaller, it, it's, diff it's a little more difficult to maneuver and your incision's got to be a good bit bigger, but, you know, it's got benefits like everything else and disadvantages too. So they have one at the ACC, I know, that um, isn't used. So we're thinking about trying it out. We'll see. Exactly. The little, mm -hmm, exactly. So we'll see. But that's another method that a lot of people do use that. So it just, it's preference, um, you know. But we'll probably get it over there and allow y'all to try both ways out at least so you can see. Um, okay. Okay, so marker placement. Um, this just kind of shows, so let's say this is a person who, it, this was palpable, um, and they treated with neoadjuvant. So this was the mass before they treated with neoadjuvant and now they want me to localize it. So now I have no way of knowing where it even is because it's so, it's regressed so much. They didn't place a marker so now I don't even know really where it is um, because it's so difficult to see now. Uh, another example so it's just, you know, somewhere down here now. It would be much easier had we placed a marker when we biopsied it. Now I could localize it according to the marker like this. So there was this big lobular mass here. Um, now, if we didn't have this marker to place, um, you know, localize it by, I wouldn't know really where we'd even done the biopsy and gotten the cancer. Uh, the pathology back, but now I can use this marker to do the needle localization. So that's why it's important that we place the marker when we do the biopsy. Okay, so um, we'll talk about the localization too. Um, so stereotactic guided biopsy. So we use mammographic guidance to do this. It's usually for calcifications or a mass or focal asymmetry that's a new mammographic finding, but we can't see it on ultrasound. So we can't do an ultrasound guided biopsy. It takes more time, it's less comfortable because the patient's prone. It's a bigger needle, it's an 11 gauge. The patient stays in compression the whole time, um, usually about 30, 40 minutes. So you have to see the finding on two views. So there's an x-axis, a y-axis. The computer uses those to calculate a z-depth. Um, we use lidocaine and then lido with epi to numb um, deeper into the skin. It is an 11 gauge. You want to watch out for vessels because, you know, we don't have cautery like they do in the OR. So if we get into bleeding, it can be an issue. Um, in order to decide how you're going to localize it, you have to decide how you can see it best. and um, what depth you want to go, whether it's easier to get to from, from the MLO or from the CC. Um, you don't really want to go from inferior on stereo. Uh, it's just uncomfortable. And this is a vacuum device like the one we just looked at. Um, we take images a lot during the procedure to make sure our needle is at the correct location. And you have to be careful when you're working with calx because when you inject the lidocaine, those calcifications can just disperse and it'll mess up your positioning. So this is something typically, these are pleomorphic calcifications. These are worrisome for DCIS. This is something we would do a stereotactic biopsy of. This is what the setup looks like when we're doing a stereo. A stereo is very confusing, something you kind of have to see a bunch of times to get the hang of. It's very dependent on the technologist. Um, 
they really help you out as far as positioning the patient, finding the calcifications, um, making sure your calculations are all right, making sure you're not going to hit the back plate. Um, you know, if your compression's off and the computer's messed up, there's a chance that needle could fire and it hit, goes through the breast and hits the back plate. That's something you never want to happen. Um, so this X value and Y value are used to calculate your depth. So this is a 2D image. So you've got your needle, you've got to decide how far into the breast you want the needle to go. So um, that's what your computer's doing here. And that's where you don't want your computer to say you want to go too far, like back plate far. Um, so, uh, and then once you, you clean off with betadine, numb the patient up, uh, make your incision, um, the 11 gauge needle is put into the breast. That's what you're seeing here. The needle, you take two 15 degree images. Uh, take your sample and that's what, it's a vacuum assisted device so you end up having this cavity here. Um, so basically that's the, the basics of stereo. It really kind of takes doing a couple to get the hang of it. It's pretty confusing. The most confusing part is actually deciding your um, approach to it um, and that takes a lot of working with the technologist too. Okay, so like I was talking about other earlier, wire localization. So after we do a biopsy, either stereo or ultrasound guided, um, we, we make the decision to excise it if necessary. So obviously if it's malignant um, and the surgeon can't feel it to excise it that way, oh, they need us to localize it for them. Um, or if it's atypical ductal hyperplasia, we want to excise it. Um, so we usually do these early in the morning before the patient goes to the operating room. It's usually before or after they go to nuclear medicine if they're going to need to have a sentinel node done. Um, we can do it either mammographically or sonographically. We have different size wires and that's dependent on what company you use to buy your wires. 5, 7, and 10 centimeter. And we choose that depending on the depth that the lesion is on the mammogram. Um, so we have to see it on two views. And we decide on the best approach um, based on the visualization and depth of the lesion. So this is an example of the wire. There's a hook at the end. That's because when you place it and you remove the needle, you need that hook to catch so it won't come out when you're transferring the patient back to the OR or wherever they're going. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like once you've placed the wire and you see it on the mammogram. And that's the mass you're localizing. Um, so you numb up the area, then you put the needle in, remove the needle, and the wire stays. So you're going to look, so this is a cancer, and you're going to look at the two views of the breast, the CC view and the MLO view, and you're going to decide, you're going to think two things. Which view can I see the lesion best on? Well, that's not really an issue here. We can see it really well on both views. So then you're going to say, okay, which way can I get to the lesion best? Which, where is it closest to? So it's in the center of the breast here. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, <coughs> we don't, we don't want to go from below because then you're up under the patient and it's really uncomfortable for everybody and we don't want to ever go from below. And it's a, it's in the center here. It's halfway from the top, halfway from the bottom. But it's way closer to, the, so this is lateral, this is medial. So it's way closer to the lateral breast than it is the medial. So I think our best bet would be to go from lateral. So you want to say, okay, Paula, we're going to go from lateral. So Paula says, okay. So in order to go from lateral, the patient has to be put in in this position that this takes a long time to kind of get the concept of because it doesn't seem right um, because because you're seeing it on the CC view you're saying okay let's go from lateral so you would think you would put the patient in CC 
but the patient's going to be in MLO because you're coming from lateral. So you're going to stick the needle in the lateral breast, okay? So you're coming from lateral, but the patient's in the true lateral view. It takes a while to get the hang of that. Um, so you put the stylet in, the, needle, the, the wire is in the needle. Um, you pull the needle out, and once you put this in, Paula's going to take a picture, and you're going to see where you are. And you want your needle tip to be one centimeter past the lesion. And then if it is, pull the needle out. And this is a good position. You'd like your, the hook, there's, wires are made differently. So some have little beads, some have notches, some have thickened areas. So your hook, there's a middle bead or a middle thickened area. So as long as your lesion is somewhere between this thickened or bead area and the hook, that's okay. I mean, sometimes my hook is here. Sometimes, as long as my hook is past the lesion, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I really would not, I, this is a little far. I like my hook right here and the bead right here. That, that would be my goal. This is a little far down, but I'm still okay with that. So, and then Paula will finally take two CC and MLA views. So here's another example. Um, again, we're coming, we're coming medially here. This is her left breast. So that's when you've got the needle in. That's the hub of the needle, the wires in. You take the needle out and there's the wire. So this is a little short, right? The hook is just at the lesion. I'd prefer the hook to be a little bit past it. So this is what the surgeon takes out. These are all their sutures everywhere. This is your localization wire. This is perfect. The hook's a little past the lesion. There's your biopsy marker and there's the mass. So that's your specimen radiograph after they've taken it out. Bracket localization. Um, so this is used to localize, localize an area of calcifications, which is harder than a mass because it's usually a, a big area. Um, so you're going to put you're going to put two wires usually. It's either superior and inferior to the area of interest, or um, anterior and posterior. Trying to help the surgeon get negative margins. It's very difficult. Um, so they need to take out both wires and the entire area between the wires at surgery. So here's an example of something that you would want to bracket. All this. So they don't need to do a mastectomy here, really, because she's got you know a large enough breast, but she's got a big area of calx. So you can't just really put one wire. You could, but you know, the surgeon needs to know the entire area of these calcifications. So this is when you would want to do a bracket and put your needle anterior and posterior. So you use two wires. Here's an example of a bracket. So you do the same thing just twice. And then here's what it looks like on your post. Okay. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about tomosynthesis biopsy. Um, Partners in Wellness is, I think, getting an outpatient center and they're going to do, a, um, or they're going to have a tomosynthesis biopsy device. It's called a firm. It's the new Hologic machine and it allows you, so tomosynthesis, you know, you can often see asymmetries that aren't visible on mammogram or you can better evaluate dense breast tissue. The problem is, and calcs, so the problem is when you see something on Tomo, oftentimes you take those patients to stereo and you can't see them anymore. Well, this Affirm device allows you to do the biopsy on the Tomo. It's a special attachment they have and not only that, but it's not prone. Um, there's a chair. You, the patient can sit on the tomo, like while they're still in tomo, and the, the biopsy is there in the tomo unit. 
so it's pretty cool. So Tomo um, is an arc, moves around the breast, 11 images are taken, seven second exam. Um, it produces a 3D image of the breast, basically. Uh, the radiation dose is not that significant, taking into account the images. Um, excellent adjunct for the evaluation of dense breast tissue. They have it on the mobile unit at LSU. Here's just a, a Tomo unit if you've never seen one. Here's a Tomo image, same breast. So when you have better imaging, that's what you can see. It's really great at seeing distortion. So here's the attachment. Um, and here's one of those vacuum assisted devices. So um, this is put on the actual Tomo unit and you can do basically a biopsy of calcs or distortion on the Tomo unit itself. Um, so patient doesn't have to lie prone and you can do image, I mean you can do biopsies of things seen only on Tomo, which is pretty cool. Uh, one of the last things, seed loke. So instead of all those wires I was talking about, so after we loke with a wire, the patient like has a wire sticking out of their breast. And we tape it down, but the wire's there. At Parkland, it's unlike here, so they go to the OR in Feisweiler most of the time. At Parkland, they would get on a bus, and sometimes they would get on the wrong bus, and they would have that wire, and they would get lost, and it was a disaster. And they would just have the wire for days. Sometimes we would lose them. It was awful. So um, we started doing this. Um, so this is this is seed loke. So it's it's um, it's I-125. It's like the radiation dose, I think, is, no, I was trying to think, there's some flight it's equivalent to. It's not much at all. Um, I can't remember the flight, but it's, it's not a long flight. But, um, so you put it in with an 18 gauge needle. We used to put bone wax in the end of the needle, drop the seed in there, and same type thing, but instead of a wire, just the seed goes in the needle, you put it in and deploy it. Um, so it can be done up to five days prior to the OR, but that's just, that's conservative. The radiation dose, it's not based on the radiation dose, that's just kind of a standard. Um, so in the OR, they use a gamma probe to guide the surgeon to the seed. And that way, rather than the wire, they know the actual focus of where the, um, you know, the radiation is. So they can do a very, a very nice dissection around the actual epicenter of that seed rather than guessing about where we, you know, where we put the wire, wire and because we can put it exactly in the middle and, um, and um, it just, it's a, a pretty high satisfaction among radiologists and surgeons alike. Uh, I like to do in the seeds better than the wires. Um, so it doesn't mess up the sentinel node because it's a different, um, the peak is different as far as the gamma probe. Um, so the positive margins, the wire localization, 50% higher positive margins than seed loc. Um, you can do a bracket just like you would with wire. Um, let's see. Oh, so here you go. So that's what the seed looks like. That's how big it is. So to get it done, you have to really depend on your radiation safety officer. You have to have nukes involved, path, and surgery because you have to, you know, have a pig um, in surgery when it's taken out and stuff like that. Um, but it, it's something that we're working on here. Um, we got to talk to nukes people and stuff like that, but it's, it's got some real benefits. So um, Dr. Kim and I are thinking about it. So we'll see. Y'all have questions about that? Last thing. So cryoablation, probably going to start doing fairly soon. Uh, is for treatment of benign fibros as an alternative to surgery. 
So, like y'all know, we do it for other things. Um, you can do it using ultrasound guidance, um, no sutures, stereo strips. So, um, instead of there's no cavity, no hematoma. If they t like, if they take the fibro out and do it in the office, it's just like getting an ultrasound guided biopsy. Um, so you can do it for for fibros up to four. If they're larger than four centimeters, it's contraindicated. Oh. Um, so they, the fiber has to be sonographically visible, obviously. You have to biopsy the fiber first to confirm that it is, in fact, a fiber adenoma. It has to be less than four centimeters. Um, it can't be suggestive of phyloides. So sometimes the pathology will say fibroepithelial lesion. That's not okay because it could be a phyloides. Um, if it's poorly visualized, that's not okay. Um, if the if the imaging findings or physical exam is discordant, you can't do that. Um, so the company we're probably going to use is called Ice Cure. So just like any other cryoablation, it's um, you know it's rapid cooling and thawing of this fibroadenoma. It takes about 15 minutes, and then over a period of either six, about six to nine months, the fibroadenoma um, goes away. So um, doesn't happen immediately. Um, the, the main um, side effects, according to patients polled, were um, intermittent pain, but uh, they reported um, excellent or good results and um, better results than surgical excision. So I think we're going to start doing that soon. So we shall see. Questions? Anybody? Anything? I have two more.